Welcome to Fading Memories, a podcast with advice, wisdom, and hope from caregivers who have lived the experience and survived to tell the tale. Think of us as your caregiver best friend. Back with us today is our favorite cool doctor, Dr. Elena Mucci. You may remember her from last month when we talked about frailty. Today we're talking, uh uh-oh, all things incontinent. So thanks for joining me today, Elena. Thank you very much. It's lovely to see you again, Jenny. You too. Hopefully soon we'll be able to travel. And I know my husband's itching to go to Europe. So we have a lot of people to meet over in the UK soon. So, And I miss my American College of Physicians conferences, which I used to do every year. So yes, looking forward to that as well. Sounds terrific. So last month we talked on frailty, what it is, how to prevent it or prevent it from getting worse. So mm-hmm. what's on on topic for incontinence today? How is that tied into aging well? Jenny, where do I start? What <laughs> an enormous topic um, and a very important and interesting one. And I think as we get into the conversation, I'd like to get a couple of things out there straight away. And the first thing is, incontinence and aging are not the same thing. Incontinence at any age is not normal. As we get older and if we start experiencing incontinence episodes, we shouldn't just say, well, what do you expect? I'm 85, I'm 90. Of course, these things happen. No, it is not normal to get incontinence. So if that is happening, medical attention should be sought because Yes, of course, we are experiencing certain changes down there in terms of our bladder, urinations, bowels, and I will talk about this physiological changing changes in our body systems. However, incontinence is abnormal. The second, the second thing is it can happen at any age. A 20-year-old can be incontinent, yet a 90-year-old lady can be absolutely fine with her continence. So these are the two important facts to consider. When it comes to the aging changes, incontinence, I think we mainly will be talking about bladder today. I think it would be too much. We will maybe talk about bowels if you have any questions, but let's concentrate on the bladder or in today's podcast. So when it comes to changes, aging changes, Of course, the bladder muscle, which we call the trusa muscle, does get a little bit of a mind of its own. And we get more contractions, more involuntary contractions. And suddenly out of the blue, you might have been to the toilet only half an hour ago and you start getting urges. So that's one of the changes we experience. The capacity of how much urine the bladder can hold before it uh, tells your brain that you need to empty your bladder, that capacity goes down as well. And then, of course, let's not forget, as we grow older, we develop other problems, uh, most commonly mobility problems, arthritis, um, Uh, muscle weakness. And of course, the pure ability to go to the toilet becomes a challenge and not getting there in time sometimes can lead to the uh, little accident. So these are the main aging changes we need to know about. And of course, these coupled with other changes in their body. For example, as we grow older, we develop some furring and hardening of the blood vessels uh, on the brain. We call that small vessel ischemic changes, uh, small vessel disease. That, of course, has an impact. Of course, what our blood is regulated by, multiple mechanisms, but mainly by the brain. If you get the blood vessels of the brain furred up, that will have impact on your bladder. And of course, cause the bladder to contract involuntarily. Uh, uh, so these, these are the main main aging changes we need to be aware of. Makes sense. So we need to take care of our brains so we don't have bathroom issues. Oh, that's, uh, <laughs> that's well said, Jenny. And if we go further into the, you made a really good point there because we need to take care of our brain. People with strokes, 
People who go on and um, let's say there, there, there are many reasons for strokes, but the most common cause is smoking, um, diabetes, obesity, and so on. These risk factors lead us to have recurrent strokes. And of course, strokes is one of the main risk factors for developing bladder problems as well. So a lot of patients with stroke do develop incontinence, do develop invol the, these involuntary contractions, which in medical terms we call or were active bladder syndrome. So uh, it leads to urge incontinence, but the simple mechanism is, imagine your bladder, it consists of one muscle, which is called the chooser muscle, and it just contracts whenever it wants, involuntarily. So that's a basic solve of that overactive bladder syndrome. It's one of the commonest conditions which we see in our post-stroke patients. So absolutely, take care of your brain. That's the one thing doctors don't seem to know how to fix too well. So preventative measures are definitely a good idea. Mm -hmm. Talking about the nerves, uh, I mean, we touched on the brain, but talking um, about the nerves, uh, of course, there is a, I mean, the blood is nerve regulated, of course, amongst many other mechanisms. Um, other neurological conditions are common causes for overactive blood and generally blood problems, continence problems. It's a multiple sclerosis, for example. Um, a lot of our MS patients experience problems with uh, continence. And of course, let's not forget dementia, acute delirium episodes, Parkinson's disease, uh, the list goes on. Is there something one can do if you've got the rest of you is healthy, but you've got an overactive bladder or you think you have an overactive bladder besides medication? I know somebody mm -hmm. that similar to myself not very tall, little heavy, and had been a lot heavier. This friend of mine, we both went on the same path of losing quite a tremendous amount of weight. And she's a teacher. She went on the medication for overactive bladder. And I looked at the list of possible side effects and I was like, yeah, no, thank you. <laughs> That's not something I'm ever interested in taking, but I always mm -hmm. tell people on airplanes, I need to sit on the aisle seat because I have TB. And they yeah. look at you in horror, and I'm like, yeah, tiny bladder. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I haven't had that one, Jenny. <laughs> it, wor fun. it works, but you, you have to give it the pause between saying TB and then telling them it stands for tiny bladder. That way they leave you alone. <laughs> I had a gal mm -hmm. that tried really hard to get me to move to the middle seat. My husband mm -hmm. was on the window, the middle seat was open, and I was on the aisle. And she tried real hard to get me to move, and... I pulled that one on her and she went and sat somewhere else. <laughs> it was, it was very useful, but it's very true, but I do drink a lot of water and a lot of tea. And I find I have less of an issue when I drink a lot less, but. I don't mm. think I, well, the, the drinking is a, is an interesting one, how to deal with the drinking. But uh, Jenny, before we move on, on to the treatments and how to deal with overactive bladder, I think we it would be good to actually understand different types of incontinence. And um, uh, there are many types, of course, but again, I try to uh, summarize them into the main ones. We have spoken about the overactive bladder, or we also call it urge incontinence, and the main mechanism of this is, is involuntary contractions of the bladder detrusor muscle. There is, of course, the and the main symptom of that is exactly that. Completely out of the blue, you get the urgency, uh, frequency, you go, for, and it's painful. Uh, when the urge comes, it's quite painful to hold it back. You have to rush to the toilet. You have to be there. And then when you do go to the toilet, the amounts you pass are quite small and you go every half an hour. So that's what we call urge incontinence or overactive bladder. There is, of course, and by the way, especially in all the patients, in all the people, 50 to 70% of the incontinence um, episodes are due to this condition. Uh, there is the second commonest type of incontinence, and that's a 
stress incontinence. And that's to do with a different muscle group we call pelvic muscle. So that's because of the weakness of the pelvic floor muscles. And that, that, that we see that type of incontinence, especially in females who have been through multiple births uh, in their younger years. And obesity is a major predisposing factor as well to the stress incontinence and you know that you have a stress incontinence when you lick a little bit with a cough or a, a laugh or if you lift something heavy it leaks you can't muscles are not strong enough to quite hold it back there um, the important one in all the patients is overflow incontinence now I think it will be very interesting in our to our listeners who are carers for patients with dementia, with um, memory concerns, neurological conditions, degenerative neurological conditions, the likes of Parkinson's, or anyone who has poor mobility, because with poor mobility comes the constipation. With constipation comes urinary retention you see if you have a lot of feces in your inside you that will impact on the bladder emptying okay the feces the bowels will be pressing on the bladder you won't be able to empty your bladder properly and then it, the bladder accumulates urine and you have overflow incontinence in other words jenny your bladder can hold up to, I have seen up to one and a half, two liters of urine, but there comes a time that it can't hold anymore and you just gradually start leaking out. Does that make sense to you? So yeah. we call that overflow incontinence. One of the commonest causes for that is constipation when the blood is not emptying properly. Um, the other common cause we see particularly in men is large prostate. So the large prostate can cause obstruction to the urine uh, passing out. So, uh, and of course, various neurological conditions, stroke, delirium can, can cause many other neurological con conditions can in fact relax and medications. It can be a side effect of medications, which relax the blood muscle so much that it becomes, loses its tone, stops contracting and you accumulate urine and then you have the overflowing continents. And I think the last one I'd like to mention um, while we are talking about different types is functional incontinence. And I've already touched on functional incontinence. That's actually nothing much wrong with the bladder and urinary tracts as such, but you can't get there in time. You might be someone with really severe disabling stroke. You might be someone who has really bad arthritis or you had recent hip replacement, whatever, you just can't get there in time. And distinguishing between these types is so important because obviously your management plan and treatment will depend on exactly on what type of incontinence you are dealing with. If it's functional, getting a commode next to the bed might be all what you need. However, if it's a overactive bladder, then we need to talk various techniques, bladder training, but medications might come here as well. That's all really fascinating. I'm really so glad I had lunch already. <laughs> <laughs> and I hope you've uh, been to the toilet just before our conversation. Like I said, I have tiny bladder, so that always happens. <laughs> if I don't, trouble. Then I have to rush down the hall. Mm -hmm. So... My grandmother, who you know, by the, we're recording this at the end of February, she will be 103 in just over a month. And that was one of the things that triggered her, her change in medical status was sudden incontinence. And I'm wondering if it's, I mean, obviously you can't know, but it seems to me like something must have happened like a minor stroke. Does it have to be a major stroke to affect your bladder or could it just be her advanced age and other infirmaries, infirmities mm. caught and a minor stroke that maybe wouldn't have been obvious to her? I'm always using her as the example because yes. 
No, that's a, that's a very good question. A very, very good question, uh, Jenny. And you brought me to, in fact, discussing yet another type of incontinence, which we can add to the types which we've discussed, and that's called transient incontinence, okay? So it's very important to, whenever we are discussing incontinence, to decide, has this been building up and it's chronic, or has there been an acute onset uh, to, to the episodes. And it's exactly what you said. When you come to a certain age, you have multiple factors which predispose you to incontinence. As I said, you could have had tiny little strokes. You have fair enough of the uh, uh, blood vessels. You might have poor mobility and uh, you might be on certain medications which interfere with the contract contractions of your detrusor muscle. You might be a male with a little bit of enlarged prostate and then an event comes. And that event can be a bigger stroke. The event can be a urinary tract infection. Let's not forget one of the major causes of acute transient incontinence, urinary tract infection. Uh, you treat the urinary tract infection, antibiotics, the continence gets better. Um, then there could be a urinary catheter. Jenny, you cannot imagine how many episodes of incontinence is caused by us doctors or nurses because uh, patients come to hospital unwell and when someone is really, really unwell, they do end up with having a urinary catheter uh, in the ED department. And of course, you take the catheter out and if they have the catheter for several days, the bladder uh, forgets how to contract. It interferes with everything down there and people might have a transient incontinence. So to answer your question, uh, with transient incontinence, Jenny, it is usually a, an acute event on the background of other predisposing factors um, which didn't help the situation. And in, in the case of your grandma, it could have been anything. It could have been a, a, a bigger stroke or... As I said, UTI, delirium is a big one. Huge, huge risk factor for acute transient incontinence in a hospital setting, acute delirium with, with infection. Constipation, of course, is the other one. So, yeah, it's there. there is always a predisposing factor. That makes sense. Or, or starting a new medication, Jenny. That's the other one. You know, whenever we are talking about the incontinence, uh, my first question would be, have you been started on a medicine recently? What was the medicine? Let's have a look into your medication chart as well. It makes sense. She probably either had a UTI or a minor, minor, really minor stroke would be my oh. guess. Hmm. It could have been a bigger stroke because based on what my aunt told me, and we're going back almost a year, so this is having to... Uh, dig deep in the history of my mind here i believe that she was having some delirium like some memory issues incontinence hmm. and so but it was literally felt overnight which we kind of touched on last time with the frailty so yeah my poor grandmother is the subject of all my curiosities lately <laughs> and did she recover from that acute uh, incontinence or it became a, be a beginning of her being that way um, well, she does wear the undergarments to take care of it, but she's, she's capable of getting to the toilet, but she's mostly blind from glaucoma and she uses a walker and she's very, very slow. So there's the, uh, functional incontinence, I'm assuming. Yeah. I think there's a mm -hmm. couple different things going on with yeah, her. Yeah, quick learner, Jenny. <laughs> I'll try. <laughs> I know learning new things is good for my brain and... Mm. You know, this is an easy way for me to learn stuff. I don't have to, you know, read it and try to, I, I love to read, but I don't, I don't know. I learn better through conversations, I guess. So mm -hmm. I have chosen the right uh, medium for that. I know with people with Alzheimer's, the disease affects their brain to the point where they, I've been told, and this is the general assumption that they forget how to toilet. Is, is that your experience or is that just our kind of, passive excuse because we don't really know how to deal with it. I have got a gal in my support group who's <clears throat> whose mom can't seem to remember that she seems to think everything is the toilet except the toilet, which is a mm -hmm. huge problem for this gal. 
And Jenny, uh, you reminded me, and I, I will answer your question, but you also reminded me of a patient of mine with Alzheimer's dementia. He's a relatively young gentleman. He's 67, 68, and uh, he was diagnosed with the Alzheimer's disease about seven years ago. He's now coming to the really end stages of the disease. And the saddest thing is that he, he was incontinent, and it was just about manageable. But now he just does it whenever he wishes in another residence room, in the corridor, in the kitchen during the breakfast. He just takes his trousers down and he does it. And it came to a point where they can't manage him anymore. And and the care home is evicting him. His wife was given a notice to get him somewhere else. So it can be very, very nasty, this problem in patients with dementia. I know that uh, firsthand. But uh, as for the mechanisms, why this is happening, one of the mechanisms is, of course, neurological disturbance um, in the control of the bladder because of the obviously the, um, it's a neurodegenerative condition. The second component is simply not understanding about the uh, a component of urination, not only physically how to do it, but also socially understanding that there is only certain places you can do it. So yes, there is that component as well. There is also a third component, functional journey, where of course, they don't only forget how to urinate, the patients with dementia also forget how to walk. So the walking becomes a problem, not finding the toilet, not getting to the toilet in timely manner. So the, he just opening his bowels in the middle of the corridor before he gets to the toilet. So yes, there are number of components out there, unfortunately. And uh, when we come to the first neurological one, we shouldn't uh, completely dismiss that incontinence as a normal part of dementia. We should try to deal with it. And understanding that there is a huge neurological component, I do treat my patients with dementia with the medications which calm down their bladder. When we say neurological, we are talking about urge incontinence, the overactive bladder. So the treatment for that particular kind of incontinence is, in fact, medications which calm down the bladder muscle, calm down the contractions, so they don't get the urge. So that's, it must be tried. I'm going to suggest that to this gal in my support group because her mom is wrecking the house. Mm. I mean, the carpets will need to be replaced. Furniture needs to be replaced. I mean. Yeah. Jenny, when you, when you talk to her about medications, however, it's important to mention that the medications we use for overactive bladder, the likes of oxybutynin, tolperidin, darifenacin, these are medications with what we call anticholinergic activities, and they're relatively contraindicated in patients with dementia. They can actually make memory worse. So we do have alternatives. These medicines, if we can, should avoid. I mean, some of them are better than the others when it comes to crossing the uh, blood-brain barrier, like solifenacin is supposed to be a bit better, darifenacin. But there are alternatives. There is the medication called mirabegron, which doesn't have the anticholinergic properties. Uh, has to be discussed with the doctor before they go that direction. That makes sense. So your patient who is getting evicted from the care home, what are you going to do for him? Because that's a that's a horrible situation. And it's similar. We have I know people that have dealt with similar issues. This gal in particular, because of her mom's mm. toileting issues. The other ones, it's a totally different topic. So mm -hmm. are you going to treat him with medication and hopefully it improves or I mean, what? can we do when they get to that point, I guess is my question. Yeah, so with him, I first got involved with him in October last year, and I did treat him with Mirabegron, the medication I uh, mentioned for active blood. I started with a low dose, I increased the dose, and it seemed 
to do the trick to a degree. But we came into January and I received the um, a call from his wife in January. So it's October, November, December, uh, four months okay. past. And uh, uh, at that stage, the problem exacerbated again and um, she is looking for a new care home. It's just awful. She Fortunately, in- I, I did not have to deal with that with my mom. She was beginning to forget all the steps involved one week she sat on the toilet instead of straight she sat on it sideways which was very uncomfortable which she of course immediately complained about and it took a little effort to shift her forward on the seat and the mm-hmm. literally a week later she told she was always telling me she had to go to the bathroom before we left i think that was just a habit which is fine and she, I always open the door to the restroom and, you know, so, cause obviously if she, you couldn't just tell her it was, oh, it's, oh, it's right here. No, that's a door. So I'd open the door, we'd walk in together. And this one day she just looked at me, she goes, why am I in here? Well, you told me you needed to use the bathroom before we left. Oh, okay. And she just stood there and I'm like, oh man, if I help her with her clothes, I was very concerned about getting scratched. Cause that was what mm. she did when she was. When you gave her assistance, she didn't think she needed, but that was, I think that was like January, February, and she broke her leg in March, early March. And so that obviously <laughs> prevented her from use, walking to the bathroom after that point. So I never had to deal with that. And it's just, it's just so sad because I had a dog that had that problem. It's like, he couldn't walk to get outside and go to the bathroom and he was geriatric. And it's like, you're not getting better from whatever happened to you earlier this week. So I guess I know what that means. And, you know, we had to let him go. But with humans, you know, we're just expected to constantly follow them around and clean up puddles and messes. And, hmm. oh, it's awful. <laughs> but, Jenny, let's talk uh, Let's talk about incontinence problems when we are dealing uh, with a problem at the beginning. Because um, getting a bit positive about this. <laughs> a lot of the contents problems can be addressed uh, with a careful with a careful evaluation, examination of the patient. And if we talk about our older adults with or without memory problems, um, the, the main the basics to cover, of course, is first thing first, treat the constipation at all times, make sure that the bowels are regular. The second thing is drink plenty of water because, Jenny, what happens? They don't drink enough. The urine becomes very concentrated and the concentrated urine irritates the bladder, the lining of the bladder. And that can irritate the bladder and cause contractions as well and cause UTIs. And UTIs, of course, cause incontinence, one thing leading to another. Um, then the, so the uh, uh, treat constipation, drink plenty of water, exclude the bladder irritants. So exclude from your diet the type of stuff which cause those contractions. I am, of course, talking about caffeine and alcohol. These are the main things to mention. Of course, fizzy drinks, let's not forget about those as well. And I know a lot of our my patients like Pepsi and Coca-Cola, and I say absolutely big no-no. Um, I advise if someone does love their tea and coffee, and let's uh, not forget there is a lot of caffeine in tea as well, not just coffee. I advise to switch to decaf, but Jenny, we have caffeine even in decaf drinks. So if we are serious about this, addressing this problem, it's substituting your hot drinks with herbal drinks, uh, with water, so completely going caffeine free. So excluding the irritants, treating the infections, and then medication review. So here we can do a whole three-hour talk when it comes to medications. And you and I agreed to have a medication talk, and we can discuss this in the future. But a thorough medication review by the um, primary care physician or pharmacist or nurse is quite essential because I can... You give me a name of a medicine and I will find a way of it affecting their blood and urinary tracts. Almost every medicine affect that. Uh, simple ones to mention is water tablets, furosemide, 
yeah, makes people go frequently and uh, they don't get there. So, and then looking around their home and um, uh, talking about functional incontinence, do we need rails for them to be safe to get to the toilet so they're not scared to fall? Do we need a four-wheel walker? Do we need a commode next to bed? And things like that. Um, with overactive bladder, before we even touch any medications, with overactive bladder, it's also important bladder training. If your loved one just came out of hospital and if they did end up with urinary catheter, their bladder is disturbed a little bit, bladder training is very important. So what I tell my patients is to keep a bladder diary and let's say you get the urge, don't go to toilet, try to suppress the urge and go to toilet, let's say, every one and a half hours or every two hours or every one hour to begin with. But don't go every 15 minutes every time you have an urge. So suppressing the urge, so waiting there um, while they address everything else, of course. So blood training is a big component of the management of um, overactive bladder. And of course, then come the medications, medications which calm down the contractions of the bladder, which I've mentioned already. That's all we active bladder. When we're talking about uh, pelvic, weak pelvic floor, uh, and that is the stress incontinence when you leak with every cough or sneeze or laugh, that's pelvic floor exercises. So I actually advise uh, to my younger older patients, if you want, who don't have any continence problems, to train their pelvic floor muscles now. Jenny, hopefully you will live 200. And let's face it, our pelvic floor will go weak. You had children. It's inevitable. You know how we exercise. We talk about the benefits of exercising, maintaining our muscles and how exercise helps you being more mobile, more sort of mentally productive, helps osteoporosis. The same about pelvic floor. It's so easy, you know, to find the pelvic floor exercises online. Just do them the same way as you brush your teeth for a few, you know, a couple of minutes every day, um, strengthen them, and then you will age with a proper, strong pelvic floor muscles. So that's a stress incontinence management. And, um, and then all the other ones are sort of more medical and will need medical interventions, of course. Uh, talking about water, Jenny, I mentioned drinking plenty of water, but of course, let's not forget, especially with all the adults, we have nocturia. Nocturia is the frequency during getting up to go to toilet at night. And when I say drink plenty of water, of course, I mean during the day. A lot of my older patients do have a habit of taking a large cup of tea and going to bed with that cup of tea or having a lot of water, a large cup of tea and a full glass of water to take their medications and then they wonder why they're up to go to the toilet every two hours so my general advice is drink plenty of water during the day but especially if you have the frequency during the night cut down on your uh, fluids after 6 p.m just have a just have water with your medications for example that's what i do i try not to drink past 8 8 30 in the evening i go to bed around 10 yeah, because yeah. I do generally get up at least once and that helps not to mm -hmm. have to get up more than once. Mm -hmm. So we were talking about not drinking enough causes an irritation, which can cause the UTI, which can cause the incontinence. That is not a roller coaster we want to get on. Do you have any suggestions for how to encourage older adults, especially ones with neurodegenerative diseases to drink more? Because that was always a challenge with my mom. And thankfully she never got UTIs, but I know lots of people that that's a common seem to have a UTI every other month. And that sounds mm -hmm. like, sounds like a way to just have more and more problems. Yeah. Uh, there are, there are so many reasons for UTIs and um, not drinking enough is one of the reasons, of course, but there are, of course, especially in females, you know, they, 
um, a distance between the anus and urethra is much shorter than it is in males and bacteria travel backwards and forwards. And there, there are a number of factors, but UTIs are, are a huge problem. So, um, Jenny, what was your question? How to get them to drink more? Um, yes. It's a difficult one. I advise fluid diary as well as bowel diary. As you know, one of my mottos as a geriatrician is be your own doctor. I spend considerable amount of time with my patients. And by the way, my new patient consultations are 60 minutes. So I'm very lucky to be allowed that time in my hospital. Uh, half of that time, I sit down and actually teach them of how to do things, how to control their health. So I say, imagine your flat or your house is a mini hospital. Have everything organized properly. Uh, put notes everywhere. Have a blood diary. Have a bowel diary. Have a medication diary. And have a fluid chart. So document what you have drunk. Let's face it, a lot of our patients with dementia do have carers. And back here in England, carers might be visiting two, three, up to four times a day. And if they manage 250, 300 meals of water during that visit and document that, we will all know what is happening. So it's literally diary everything. One more thing, one more need for an app. <laughs> you can track <laughs> oh, your oh, reminder. Yeah, Flavor yeah. and of course, you know, the, some of my patients say, well, I, I drink a lot of coffee. I hate water. Well, flavor it. There are there are ways of getting the, the water into you. What about a cranberry juice, which um, of course, I'm not advocating for a cranberry juice because we, we don't, as a preventative measure for UTIs, a lot of people take tablets, cranberry tablets, cranberry juice. The evidence is not clear. There is no clear cut evidence that cranberry juice reduces the frequency of UTIs. But neither it will harm. Uh, there is anecdotal evidence in some of my patients coming back and saying, yes, it did help them. Uh, of course, we need to be careful in diabetic patients because cranberry juice, like any juice, will have a lot of sugar in it. It can be substituted with tablets. But when it comes to fluids, uh, yeah, you, you can flavor your drinks and uh, diary their intake. Yeah, you go to lots of fancy restaurants or hotels and they've got water with citrus fruits and mint. Now I'm making myself want something other than plain water. <laughs> but Jenny, there um, uh, one thing which does get me upset as a geriatrician is when I see patients on water medications, the likes of rusimide, um, Lasix is the other name of this medication, and then um, prescribed by one doctor, and there another doctor complaining that they are not taking enough fluids and advising the patient to drink more. And then they come to see the third doctor, me, and saying, doctor, what the hell? This doctor gave me the water medication and this doctor told me to drink more. You must be the one to tell me what I'm really supposed to do here. So it, it, we need to talk together with the they keep going to one to different specialists, getting different advice, and it is very confusing. I feel for my patients. So all patients out there, all the carers looking after the, their loved ones on water medications, please do discuss with the pharmacist or doctor whether we can reduce the dose maybe, whether that water medicine, if your mom or dad is going through a patch where they're a bit unwell, not eating, drinking too much, they're getting a bit dry, their urine is very dark and smelly, maybe for a week or two their water medication dose can be reduced or halved, give them a little bit of a break, get the fluid levels up. So it's so personalized, isn't it? It's mm -hmm. the, the, the care should be so fine-tuned. And uh, that's what I love about geriatric medicine. What age should we consider switching from an adult medicine to a geriatrician? Oh, that's a good one. <laughs> uh, well, all us geriatricians also um, um, 
accredited for to do general internal medicine. I actually have two accreditation. I'm a general physician as well as geriatrician. So Jenny, one day I might be doing well men's clinic, seeing 45, 50 year old people who come to me to have this type of discussions, preparing them for the next 25, 30 years. And we'll sit down and bit by bit go through everything, every body part and you know, discussing the what, what are their possibilities for various diseases. And next day I will be seeing 80, 90 year olds. So um, I think we are geriatricians, probably the last tribe who also does proper general medicine. I ask because I have to get a different doctor and there are currently no adult general medicine doctors in my city or the one next over. I would advise you to seek a geriatrician because as are those. <laughs> Here in England, geriatricians are those general medical physicians. I guess in you in America, you will be going to your primary care doctor, right? Your so these are their general medics who will see you as a whole and then signpost you to various subspecialties depending on what they find. But for more in-depth sort of general medical opinion, here people come to see a geriatrician, people of any age, really. Yeah, I need to call my health insurance company and say, okay, well, there's no doctors in my area taking new patients. So how about how about a geriatrician, even though I'm only 54? <laughs> mm -hmm. They'll probably tell me, no, you need a general physician first. And I'm not mm -hmm. driving, you know, 45 minutes to go to the doctor. So hopefully Jenny, I you reminded me of my last clinic. I had this 49-year-old in my wellman's clinic. And we did everything. He was very pleased. Everything was fine, but we found that he has familial hyperlipidemia, mixed hyperlipidemia or dyslipidemia. His cholesterol levels are high. He is totally fit and well, very strong exercising man. And uh, nobody could persuade him to take cholesterol tablets. And mm -hmm. that's, he came to me to talk why he should. Everybody tells him why. But so, yeah, we had a good consultation. And by the end of it, I could not persuade him to take the cholesterol tablets until I mentioned to him that high cholesterol might uh, also fur up the blood vessels in his penis and that might have an erection on his, uh, so sort of might have an effect on his erection. He said, give me that prescription, doctor. <laughs> so well, we have the ways. <laughs> that's funny. We had a trainer at my gym. I think she had a heart attack at 42 and she was... She'd been an athlete, fit, physical trainer all her life. She didn't tell anybody for a long time what had happened to her because mm. she was embarrassed. But it was the same thing. It, her body just makes cholesterol and mm. she mm. has to be on the medication. So, yeah, your your reasoning for him wouldn't have worked with her. But <laughs> he finally did um, start telling people about it. And then she started doing fundraisers for the like American heart association. And she started doing a lot more awareness, which was, I thought really helpful, but of course I haven't seen her for over a year because the gyms have been closed <laughs> and now I have a Peloton. So I work out at home by myself with the, the person on the screen. My whole life is on screens. <laughs> on the screen now. Yes. Ours as well. <laughs> yeah, it's it's been a challenge. So is there anything else we need to know about incontinence and preventing it or caring for it before I let you go off into the, the wee hours of the evening? I think just to conclude, uh, Jenny, we need to remember about the impact of incontinence on their quality of life. And uh, in younger people, as well as older, in younger patients, I had a 50 plus year old uh, businesswoman who was flying all over the place. And um, she actually didn't have any major conditions, any health conditions. In her case, it just happened. And how disturbing it was for her just running to the toilet the second she was coming off the plane. She couldn't sit at her meetings. 
she was constantly worried about having a smell. And in her case, it was a very simple intervention, giving the medications, calming down the blood. Uh, she was so thankful. Uh, it transformed her life with all the patients. It's there, they being in the community, going out there to their clubs, playing the bridge, going out to meet the friend. It's such a big part of their life. And I have had so many patients giving up on their social life and giving up on the quality of their life for embarrassment of their incontinence and not seeking medical attention, not telling their children, not telling their GP, thinking that this is them being old now. It's an old age and their embarrassment and they smell and they, rather than talking about it, being honest about it, they were hiding and becoming a recluse in their houses, developing depression, uh, a shielding from the society. So my final message is, once again, incontinence is not normal at any age. And if that happened to you or your loved one, please seek medical help. There could be a simple solution which will transform your life and get your quality of life back. That's what we're all striving for is a good quality of life. This has been fantastic. I learned stuff I didn't know I needed to know. <laughs> <laughs> more to come, Jenny. More to come. <laughs> more to come. Yes. Dr. Lena will be with us once a month, every month until we run out of things to talk about. <laughs> oh, that will never happen. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's good because I have podcasts to put out all the time. So this has been. My husband, my husband says I can talk for England. <laughs> That sounds true. I know you're making me want to to uh, relocate, be a expat, go back to my uh, ancestral home of Scotland. All right. <laughs> Although I don't like cold or wet, so I don't know about that part. <laughs> Fading Memories is also available wherever you get your favorite podcasts.